Hi guys, welcome back to Codemaster Coach, your medical coding tutor. Guys, we're still continuing our review of the 2024 ICD-10-CM official coding guidelines. So, you know the drill. Let me minimize my box. And let's get started. On last week, we ended Yep, we said we're going to start here at E, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA conditions. Now understand that MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. MRSA is a staph germ or bacteria that does not get better with the type of antibiotics that usually cure staph infections. So let's go to A in the official coding guidelines, combination codes for MRSA infection. All right, so we're talking about the selection and sequencing of MRSA codes. So we're starting with combination codes for MRSA infection. When a patient is diagnosed with an infection that is due to methicillin staph resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, and that infection has a combination code. Remember, a combination code includes the causal organism. It's combined in that code, for example, with sepsis and pneumonia. So assign the appropriate combination code for the condition. And they gave you, for example, A41.02, sepsis due to methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or even code J15.212, pneumonia due to methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So notice how these combination codes, A4102 and J15.212, include the infection. So it says, do not assign code B95.62, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus in infections as the cause of disease classified elsewhere as an additional code. We don't need that additional code because the combination code includes the type of infection and the MRSA organism. So do not assign a code from category Z16.11, resistance to penicillin, as an additional diagnosis. Do not use that additional code along with the combination code because your combination code includes it all. All right, let's make sure we're on target. That's A, yep, pay attention to the yellow highlights. So notice I was just saying, in addition to the combination code, do not assign a code from category Z16.11, resistance to penicillin, because it's understood in the combination code. Okay, we're at B, other codes for MRSA infection. Again, we're going to go back to the guidelines and pay attention to the highlights. So at B, it says other codes for MRSA infection. When there is documentation of a current infection, such as a wound infection, a stitch abscess, or a urinary tract infection due to MRSA, and that infection does not have a combination code that includes the causal organism, then assign the appropriate code to identify the condition along with the B95.62 methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus infection as the cause of disease classified elsewhere for the MRSA infection. So notice when you do code urinary tract infection, that N39.0 just says urinary tract infection. You're gonna need an additional code to identify what type of infection. You're going to need that B95.62 to identify the infection as the cause of disease as classified elsewhere. So there is no combination code for the, these particular conditions. And when the code does not include the infectious organism, use the additional code. But do not assign a code from subcategory Z16.11 resistance to penicillin because it's understood already with MRSA. Okay, it's already understood. All right, going back to our guideline C, methicillin susceptible, 
Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, M-S-S-A, and MRSA colonization. So I had to under- try to understand what exactly M-S-S-A, I've heard of MRSA, but the methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus, it says here, is Staphylococcus aureus often shorted to staph, staph aureus or S aureus, is a type of bacteria or germ which lives harmlessly on the skin and in the noses and in about one third of people. So people have this already, but being colonized with MRSA means that you carry it in your nose or on your skin, but you're not sick with the MRSA infection. You're just carrying it. And if you have signs and symptoms of a MRSA infection, such as a boil or an abscess or some type of pain or swelling on your skin, you are much more likely to spread MRSA because the infected area contains already the MRSA germs. So understand that you can be methicillin susceptible, MSSA and MRSA colonization. So you might already have this bacteria on your skin or in your nose and don't and not even be sick from it. So let's go back to the guideline for C and see what it says about MSS. Methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus, MSSA and MRSA colonization. The condition or state of being colonized or carrying MSSA, methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA is called colonization or carriage, while an individual person is described as being colonized or being a carrier, okay? You're the carrier. You're not infected. You're just carrying it. But colonization means that MSSA or MRSA is present on or in the body without necessarily causing illness. And a positive MRSA colonization test might be documented by the provider as MRSA screen positive or MRSA nasal swab positive. So you assign code Z22.322 carrier or suspected carrier of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus for patients documented as having MRSA colonization. So notice it's a Z code. You're not having any problems from it. You're just a carrier. Assign code Z22.321 carrier or suspected carrier of methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus for patients documented as having MSSA colonization. But colonization is not necessarily indicative of a disease process or as the cause of a specific condition that the patient may have unless documented as such by the provider. So if you're just the carrier, you're that Z code. You're not sick from it. You're just a carrier. All right. Let's see what D says. Colonization and infection. Just follow the guidelines. Okay. So let's go back to D. Colonization and infection. If a patient is documented as having both MRSA colonization and infection during a hospital admission, then code Z22.322, carrier or suspected carrier of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and a code from the MRSA infection may both be assigned. You're identifying the fact that they were a carrier and they got infected from it. So you can use the two. All right, let's go back to, we're down to F. Zika virus infection. With Zika virus code only confirmed cases. So let's see what Zika number one says. Code only a confirmed diagnosis of Zika virus. A92.5 Zika virus disease as documented by the provider. This is an exception to the hospital inpatient guideline selection 2H. In this context, context, confirmation does not require documentation of the type of test performed. The provider's diagnostic statement that the condition is confirmed is sufficient. This code should be assigned regardless of the stated mode of the transmission. So again, we code only confirmed cases and confirmation can just be the provider saying they have Zika infection. 
if the provider documents suspected, possible, or probable Zika, then do not assign a code A92.5. Assign a code that explains the reason for the encounter, such as fever or rash or joint pain or even Z20.821 contact with and suspected exposure to Zika virus. So if they're coming in because they know they were in contact or exposed to it, but they're not sure if they got it, but the doctor doesn't confirm that they have it, then just code the signs and the symptoms. All right, let's see what I got on here. Zika virus is a disease caused by the Zika virus, which is spread to people primarily through the bite of an infected mosquito. The most common symptoms are fever, rash, joint pain, and conjunctivitis. The illness is usually mild with symptoms lasting for several days to a week after being bitten by an infected mosquito. Zika virus infection during pregnancy can cause serious birth defects called microcephaly, which is a condition in which the baby's head is much smaller than expected, as well as other severe fetal brain defects, such as intracranial calcifications, ventricular megaly, and or cerebral atrophy. So assign code Z86.1, personal history of infectious and parasitic diseases, if documentation in the medical record indicates that the patient has a past history of Zika infection. All right. So now we're down to G, coronavirus. And guys, these guidelines have improved so much in the last couple of years since having COVID. I can remember when we didn't have a code for COVID and we just had to identify it as some type of upper respiratory tract infection. But now that ICD-10-CM has expanded and now included a code for coronavirus, we got to be very careful that we code coronavirus infections correctly. So let me make sure my handout says everything that I need to say. We're back at the guidelines, coronavirus infection, COVID-19 infection due to SARS-CoV-2. That's the test. All right, let me make sure my guidelines say everything that it needs to say. We're at A, code only confirmed cases, straight from the guidelines. So let's see what the guidelines say. Only, code only a confirmed diagnosis of the 2019 novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, as documented by the provider or documentation of a positive COVID-19 test results. So the only time we code COVID is if it's confirmed. And for a confirmed diagnosis, then you assign code U07.1 COVID-19. Now this is an exception to the hospital inpatient guideline, section 2H. In this context, confirmation does not require documentation of a positive test result for COVID-19. The provider's documentation that the individual has COVID-19 is sufficient. So in the past where we would look for confirmation with the test, we no longer need that. As long as the physician says the patient has COVID-19, we can code COVID-19. And if the provider documents suspected, possible, probable, or inconclusive COVID-19, do not assign code U071. Instead, code the signs and symptoms that the patient's coming in for. So again, if the physician says it's possible or there's a little hesitancy, probable, inconclusive, there's no confirmed test, the doctor's saying this, then you cannot code COVID. Only if the provider says positive COVID, patient does have COVID, with just the statement, does have COVID, you can code. Otherwise, you only code the signs and the symptoms. And I just put a note here, confirm cases are coded, U071. If questionable, code only the signs and the symptoms. All right, let's talk about sequencing of the codes. It says straight from the guidelines. So we're at B. When COVID-19 meets the definition of principal diagnoses, and remember, principal diagnoses is that which after study was found to have occasioned the admission of the patient, that which after study. Then code U07.1 COVID-19 should be sequenced first, followed by the appropriate codes 
for associated manifestations, except when another guideline requires that certain codes be sequenced first, such as obstetrics, sepsis, or transplant complications. So again, if your patient's coming in with these signs or symptoms of COVID, and then they test positive for COVID, then you can code the confirmed U071 COVID codes. And if there are any other manifestations, then you can code those as well, like the pneumonias or any other associated condition that can occur because of COVID. Okay. Make sure my guidelines say straight from the guidelines. Okay, we're at C, straight from the guidelines. Acute respiratory manifestations of COVID-19. When the reason for the encounter or admission is a respiratory manifestation of COVID-19, then assign code U071 COVID-19 as the principal or first listed diagnoses, and then assign code or codes for the respiratory manifestations as additional diagnoses. So they said here some following conditions are examples of common respiratory manifestations of COVID. So usually when you get COVID, some patients go on and get pneumonia. So for a patient with pneumonia confirmed as due to COVID, then assign the U071 for COVID, because if it wasn't for the COVID, they wouldn't have the pneumonia, and the pneumonia code J12.82 for pneumonia due to coronavirus disease. Show the linkage. Now, if it's acute bronchitis, for a patient with acute bronchitis confirmed as due to COVID-19, then again, assign the code U071 for the COVID and then the J20.8 for the acute bronchitis due to other specified organisms. Now, bron bronchitis not otherwise specified. They don't say that it's acute or chronic bronchitis, but they just say bronchitis due to COVID-19. Then you should code that by using the U071 because again, if it wasn't for the COVID, then they wouldn't have the bronchitis. But And then the J40, bronchitis not specified as acute or chronic. And then if you have lower respiratory infections, if COVID-19 is documented as being associated with a lower respiratory infection, not otherwise specified, then, or an acute respiratory infection, not otherwise specified, code the U071 because it's due to COVID. COVID is what caused it. And then J22, unspecified acute lower respiratory infection should be assigned. And if the COVID-19 is documented as being associated with a respiratory infection, not otherwise specified, they didn't say whether it was upper or lower, then code U071 and J98.8, other specified respiratory disorders should be assigned. All right, and if it's acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, due to COVID, then assign again the U071, because if it was, it's because of COVID, and then the J80, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if it's acute respiratory failure, then you, and it's due to COVID-19, then you're still gonna code that U071 first, and then code J96.0 and any additional digits, acute respiratory failure. So again, we're showing proof here that the COVID is causing these respiratory manifestations. Therefore, your COVID code is coded first along with. All right, straight from the guidelines. D is straight from the guidelines. Okay, let's go back to guidelines. Non-respiratory manifestations of COVID. When the reason for the encounter or the admission is a non-respiratory manifestation, for example, it's viral instead, Use code U071 for COVID-19 because, again, it's COVID-related that if it wasn't for the COVID, as the principal first listed diagnoses, and then assign a code for whatever manifestations the patient has as additional diagnoses. Again, you're showing that cause and effect relationship by putting that U07.1 code first. All right, and then we're down to E. E is straight from the guidelines, not confirmed. So let's see what E is saying. Exposure to COVID. You've been around somebody that has it. You've been in, the, in an area that COVID has been known to be in. So 
for asymptomatic, patients not experiencing any symptoms with actual or suspected exposure to COVID-19, then assign code Z20.822, contact with and suspected exposure to COVID-19. So you're coming in because you don't have symptoms of it, but you've been around somebody that has COVID. But with symptoms, individuals that have symptoms of COVID with actual or suspected exposure to COVID-19 and the infection has been ruled out or test results are inconclusive or unknown, you're still going to assign that code Z20.822, contact with and, ex and suspected exposure to COVID-19. Because again, they didn't test positive. They just been around, they've got symptoms, but they didn't, it's not confirmed. So if COVID-19 is confirmed, then you can code COVID. But until then, if they just been exposed to it, it's just the Z20.822 code. E, yep, not confirmed. Now F says, go back to your screening for COVID-19, back to the guidelines. Screening for COVID-19. For screenings for COVID-19, including preoperative testing, assign code Z11.52, encounter for screening for COVID-19. So you're just coming in for a screening. You're not confirmed. There's no ex you know, exposure, whatever. You're just coming in for a screening. That's Z11.52. G, signs and symptoms without a definitive diagnosis. It says follow the guidelines. All right, G says, for patients presenting with any signs or symptoms associated with COVID-19, such as fever, but a definitive diagnosis has not been established, then assign the appropriate codes for each of the presenting signs and symptoms, such as if they have an acute cough, R051, or just a cough, RO59, or shortness of breath, RO6.02, or just fever, R50.9. But if a patient with signs and symptoms associated with COVID-19 also has an actual or suspected contact with or exposure to COVID-19, then you can also code the Z20.822 contact with and suspected exposure to COVID-19 as an additional code. So let me make sure I reiterate it. If you're coming in with signs and symptoms, but you don't have a definitive diagnosis of COVID, then just code the signs and symptoms. And again, most of us, if we are around somebody that does have COVID, we've been exposed to it. And if we have some symptoms and we're wondering, do we have it or not? Until we're confirmed to have COVID, we don't code U071 for COVID. We'll code those signs or symptoms. And then the fact that we were exposed to the Z20.822, we can use that as an additional code. But until COVID is confirmed, you cannot code COVID. All right, that's G. H, asymptomatic. Let's go back to H. Asymptomatic individuals who test positive for COVID. So for asymptomatic individuals who test positive for COVID-19, although the individual is asymptomatic, they have no symptoms. They didn't even know they had COVID. They just tested positive for COVID. Then you do assign code U071. They do have COVID. So you code it as is. No signs or symptoms. Okay, don't code it. They still got covid they are still a U07.1. And so my notes just say, follow the guidelines. You are a U07.1. Even though you're asymptomatic, you have COVID. I, personal history, refer to the guidelines because there is a personal history of COVID code Z86.16. So let's go to the guidelines on I. For patients with a history of COVID-19, then assign code Z86.16, personal history of COVID-19. So we've got that code now as well. Let's look at J. Follow 
follow-up visits after COVID-19 infection has resolved. So I'm saying go to the guidelines. So for individuals who previously had COVID-19 without residual symptoms or conditions and are being seen for follow-up evaluation and COVID-19 test results are negative, then assign code Z09 encounter for follow-up examination after completed treatment for conditions other than malignant neoplasms and Z86.16 personal history of COVID-19. So you're coming in for Z09 examination for COVID and in the Z86.16 because you have a personal history. Now for follow-up visits for individuals with symptoms or conditions related to a previous COVID-19 infection, it's telling you go back. If they're coming in for a follow-up visit with the symptoms, then your symptom codes become your diagnoses, okay? Or you code the U071 and then the symptoms of it. All right, K. And on J, I made some notes. Z09 encounter for follow-up examination after completed treatment for conditions other than malignant neoplasms and Z86.16 personal history of COVID-19. So we have some Z codes primarily focusing on COVID-19. Case encounter for antibody testing. Let me read that one first, and then I had to go in a little more detail and understand this one. So Kay says, if you're having an encounter for antibody testing, just checking to see if it's in your system. For an encounter for antibody testing that is not being performed to confirm a current COVID-19 infection, nor is it a follow-up test after resolution of COVID-19, then assign code Z01.84, encounter for antibody response examination. Follow the applicable guidelines above if the individual is being tested to confirm a COVID-19 infection. So that's up here. We we're talking about encounter four. So let me look at my guideline because I made some notes on J, on K. Why would I need an antibody test? Because I was questioning, okay, why? Antibody serology tests can show that you have an immune response to a pathogen but they cannot show if you have full protection from a disease or how long the protection lasts. So in the case of a newer disease like COVID-19, it is not yet known how long protection lasts after being infected or vaccinated. So again, that's where your antibody testing and this K guideline comes in, where it's saying for an encounter for the antibody testing that is not being performed to confirm a current COVID-19 infection, nor is a follow-up test after resolution of COVID-19, you're just coming in for antibody testing, that's Z01.84, encounter for antibody response examination. All right, we're down to L. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And I, don't, I didn't understand what that was. And with coding, guys, you have to do a lot of research trying to understand what's going on with your patients. Multi-system multi inflammatory syndrome is a rare but serious condition associated with COVID-19 in which different body parts become inflamed, including the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain, skin, eyes, or gastrointestinal organs. So let's see what it says about multi-system inflammatory syndrome. For individuals with multi-system inflammatory system, syndrome, MIS, and COVID-19, then assign code U071 COVID-19 as the principal or first listed diagnoses, and then assign code M3581 multi-system inflammatory syndrome as an additional diagnosis because it's the COVID-19 has inflamed these other body areas. And if an individual with a history of COVID-19 develops this MIS, then assign code M3581, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and U09.9 post-COVID-19 condition unspecified. Because note, they no longer have COVID. It's a history of COVID, but they're coming in today because of this MIS. Then the MIS code goes first, but identify the fact that they had a history 
U09.9 of COVID-19. And if an individual with a known or suspected exposure to COVID-19 and no current COVID-19 infection or history of COVID-19 develops MIS, then assign code for the MIS, M3581 Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome, because that's what they're coming in today for, and Z20.822, contact with or suspected exposure to COVID-19. Because again, they don't have COVID now, but they had um, exposure to, then you capture the Z20.822. Make sure I'm covering everything. I, I made hints to myself under that um, guideline that just said COVID with MIS, the UO7.1, COVID, M3581, MIS. But if it's MIS with the history of COVID, M3581 for the MIS, UO9.9 for the history of COVID. And if it's a suspected exposure to COVID-19, but no current COVID-19 or a history of COVID-19, but you develop MIS, then again, you're coming in for MIS, which is M3581, but then I'm going to put the suspected exposure to Z20.822 code in addition. So I just made a note under that guideline for me to make sure I, I follow it. All right, with M, post-COVID-19 conditions, it says follow the guidelines. So let's go to M. Post-COVID conditions for sequela. Now remember, sequela means the residue, the result of, because you had COVID, now you have this. So for sequela of COVID or associated symptoms or conditions that develop following a previous COVID-19 infection, assign a code for the specific symptoms or conditions related to the previous COVID-19 infection, if known, and then code U09.9 for post-COVID-19 condition. So you're identifying the fact that today they have this that's a result of a previous, a sequela, a previous COVID-19, U09.9. And if an individual with a known or suspected exposure and no current COVID-19. I'm getting mixed up here. M, here it is. U09 should not be assigned for manifestations of an active or current COVID-19 infection. So again, if you're still having manifestations of a current COVID-19 infection, you're not post-COVID. You're still actively in COVID. So it's a U09.9 code. And if a patient has a condition associated with the previous COVID-19 infection and develops a new active current COVID on top of COVID, then you code the U09.9 in conjunction with what they have today, the U07.1 COVID-19, to identify that the patient also has a condition associated with the previous COVID-19 infection. And so it says codes for the specific condition associated with the previous COVID-19 infection and the code or codes for the manifestations of the new active COVID-19 infection should also be assigned. That gets a little tricky, but understand if you're post and you know how people have gotten COVID and gotten better and then turn around and got COVID again, what if you've had COVID before and you've got manifestations of a previous COVID, so the previous, the sequela, COVID U09.9, and now you have manifestations of that previous COVID, and now you pick up a new COVID virus again, so you've got COVID now. It's saying here that your COVID now, U07.1, any manifestations, but if you're coming in today for your post-previous COVID manifestations, whatever your reason for your admission today is your principal diagnoses, and if it was from the manifestations from the previous, then you code those manifestations first, by the way, they have COVID today, U07.1, whatever manifestations that you have, and then identify the U09.9 as sequela. These are sequela. These are a result of your previous COVID-19. All right, let's see if I got it all. Yep, straight from the guidelines. And then in under immunization for COVID-19, it says follow the status, the guidelines, Z80. No, Z28.310, unvaccinated for COVID-19, 
may be a sign when the patient has not received a COVID-19 vaccine of any type. Code Z28.311 partially vaccinated for COVID-19 may be a sign when the patient has been partially vaccinated for COVID-19 as per the recommendations of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in place at the time of the encounter. So again, the immunization status, are you unvaccinated, Z28.310, or if you've started the vaccination process, but you're not up to date, Z28.311. All right, straight from it. And so from these guidelines, because right now we're getting ready to go into chapter two neoplasms, and that's where I'm gonna start next week. So from these guidelines, I did create a COVID-19 cheat sheet. And I have to do this when I'm going through the guidelines so that I'm to keep going back all the way through the guidelines. Just refer to my cheat sheets like I did in a previous video, I think in part one or two. I just say COVID-19. I've already got it memorized and I always teach my students never memorize codes. But some that you use over and over, you owe 7.1. But for COVID-19, we code only, only confirmed cases by provider or test. So if the provider says it, you can code it, you owe 7.1. Or if a test test, if the test shows positive, you can code you owe 7.1, but only in confirmed cases. <clears throat> now, when as far as manifestations, which are conditions that the patient can get because they have COVID, if it's COVID with pneumonia, then I identify the fact that it's COVID, you owe 7.1, and then pneumonia, J12.82. But if it's COVID-19 and acute bronchitis, then I identify the COVID, UL 7.1, and acute bronchitis, J20.8. But if they don't identify the bronchitis as acute, and they just say COVID-19 and bronchitis, then I have to code it as such. COVID-19, UL 7.1, and just bronchitis, J40, not specified as acute or chronic. And if it's COVID-19 with a lower respiratory infection, it's UL 7.1 and J22, but if it's COVID-19 with respiratory infections not otherwise specified, then it's UO 7.1 and J98.8. Now, if it's COVID with an acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, then it's UO 7.1 because, again, we have to identify the fact that it's COVID-related and then the J80. But if it's acute respiratory failure due to COVID-19, then, of course, UO 7.1 goes first because it's because of the COVID. And then the J96.0, and make sure to capture the rest of your digits for the acute respiratory failure. If it's COVID-19 with other manifestations, then I code the UO 7.1, and then whatever the other manifestations are, I'd use additional codes for those. But if I'm just having exposure to COVID, I haven't tested positive, I've just been around or exposed to COVID. That code is Z20.822. If I'm coming in for a screening for COVID, then that's Z11.52. If it's just signs and symptoms without confirmation of COVID, then all I can code are the signs and symptoms. And then if it's signs and symptoms with exposure, you can code Z20.822, exposure to COVID, can be assigned as an additional code for the signs and symptoms. So I'd code what they're coming in today for, fever, sore throat, cough. But then I can also identify the fact that, oops, but they were exposed to COVID-19, Z20.822 as an additional code. And if they're asymptomatic, don't have any symptoms, but they've got a positive COVID test, they have COVID, they have COVID, U07.1. And if they have a personal history of COVID-19, Z86.16. And if it's a follow-up exam after the COVID-19 resolves, then I'm coming in for an exam, Z09 for, it, for COVID, and then a history of Z86.16. If it's a sequela, the result of, or manifestation of a previous COVID, 
then U09.9 identifies the fact that you previously had COVID. Now you have this manifestation of COVID. And if it's under immunization for COVID-19, then it's Z28.310. And remember the partial vaccination is Z28.311. Okay, guys, hope this makes sense. Hope this helps along with this process for coding COVID-19. And guys, I'm continuing. I'll leave the link in the description box below to get you quickly to the guidelines so that you can continue to follow along with us as we're studying these new 2024 ICD-10-CM official coding guidelines. All right, guys, thanks. I'll see you in the next one next Thursday.